very good morning, afternoon and evening to everyone who has joined us from across the world. I'm very pleased to welcome you to our last uh, seminar session on science communication and trust. Uh, this um, session is, I think, extremely timely for PCST, given the issues that we have had um, with COVID in the last two years and the spotlight that scientists and science communicators have been put into. We have four speakers today from across the world and, and they're here today to share with you uh, their stories about science communication and trust. I would remind you that you can put questions and comments into the chat and like my colleague Louisa has done, you can also uh, join um, and make comments in the chat function. Already we have 48 participants in the room and I'm expecting we'll get even more than that. So thank you very much to everyone for coming along and joining us for this last session. Our four speakers are speaking about different aspects of trust. Our first speaker, Fabian Medvecki, um, will be talking about resolving the paradox of trust in science in the post-truth post age. So his focus is very much on the science side of things. Our second speaker, Dr. Frederica Hendricks, who's from the Technological University in Brunswick in Germany, will be talking about communicating scientists and what makes people trust them. Our third speaker, Dr. Marta Entradis from the London School of Economics and Political Scientists, will be going on to speak beyond scientists and scientists to the institutions, science institutions. And our last speaker, Dr. Julia Taguena, um, will be speaking to us from Mexico about what makes an intelligent and well-intentioned person not trust scientific facts. Now, our speakers come from different countries and different time zones, and it is with great pleasure that I introduce our first speaker to speak for five minutes, Dr. Fabian Medvecki, who is a colleague of mine um, from New Zealand, where it is currently five past one in the morning tomorrow. Yes, Friday the 9th. I'm very, very happy that Fabian has joined us. Fabian, if you look at Fabian on the website, he calls himself the social epistemologist. Now, I've always wondered what that meant. I thought it might have meant that he drank too much alcohol, and I think he does. But in fact, it is about studying um, the relationship between knowledge and society. And I think that whole idea of trust in this interface is really important for this discussion. So I'm going to hand over to my very good colleague and friend, Dr. Fabian Medvecki, to talk about resolving the paradox of trust in science in a post-truth age. Thank you, Fabian. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully this will work. Um, so I want to talk about the paradox of trust in science in a post-truth age. And um, I think the first thing to note is that we have something of a paradox about trust in science. There's two fairly commonly made contradictory claim around trust in science. On one hand, we hear that trust in science is just as strong as it's ever been. We hear that scientists are trusted across the globe and then on the other hand we also hear that we have a crisis of trust in science that there is this anti-science post-truth alternative fact moment in our history and so on one hand we have a claim that says trust in science is fine it's as good as it's ever been on the other hand we have the opposite that says we have a real problem with trust in science Clearly, this seems kind of problematic. It seems like we can't have both of these claims. They both can't be true. It's a classic paradox, right? A and not A. And there's only four ways you can resolve a paradox. Either the first claim is true and the second is false, 
or the first claim is false and the second is true. They could both be false, or we might argue they're both true. Usually with a paradox, we kind of go for one or answer one or answer two. I'm going to suggest we should go for answer four, that they're both true. Um, there has been attempts to, to say that actually it's answer one. There was a recent paper by Kraus, uh, Bossa, Schufler, and Zenos from 2019 that looked at analysis of on trust in scientists for the past 40 years and said that it was high even for controversial topics such as global warming and nuclear energy, and that international comparisons showed that was broadly the same in the US, in Germany, in the UK, and in other places. And they specifically made reference to the claims of lack or decreasing trust in science and said, well, then it's not really, it doesn't seem to show in the studies. Nobody's made the second claim explicitly that, that, that we really do have this distrust issue and that the seeming consistency in trust is a problem, is not true. Um, we only have kind of articles that suggest this in more kind of popularly written articles. Nobody has said that they're both false. We could maybe make that claim, maybe argue that there's never been much trust in science in the first place, but that just seems like a crazy thing to say. That seems bonkers, so we'll just ignore that one. What I'm going to suggest is that they're both true. It's true that trust in science is as high as it's ever been. I think that's absolutely true. It's also true that we have a real crisis of trust in science. But how do we make sense of both these claims? So the first thing I want to do is try and make sense of what this sentence, trust in science, might mean. And I think the first thing to say is that trust in science is something about the level of credibility in terms of knowledge. I think that's part of what we're really talking about here, that we, it's a form of epistemic credibility. We, when we say we have trust in science, we mean that we think the claims that come out of science are true on some level. Um, but here's the catch. What's fuzzy is not trust, it's fuzzy it's science. Science means many, many things. It undermines, in a way, this, this fuzziness in science undermines our capacity to make sense of the idea of trust in science. When we say trust in science, do we mean trust in the scientific method and methodologies? Do we mean trust in the facts of science? Do we mean trust in the institutions of science? These are significantly different. And I think we need to make one really big conceptual difference here between the concept of science, what we might think science stands for as a method, as process and so forth, and then the claims of science and of scientists, the statements of facts. And it seems to me that there's been little change in trust in the concept of science. And I'm gonna point some examples of this in a second, but there's been a decrease in the trust in the claims of science. And it's good to think of things like creation science as a term or things like the many claims made by various alternative medicines, that they have scientific research to back their claim. So even in rejecting the claims of mainstream science, these groups, these people, appeal to the epistemic credibility of the concept of science. When you read things about the scientific explanations for the pair of crystals in healing, they appeal to the, to the validity of science as a concept, even to undermine the claims of science. So what's waned is, is the epistemic credibility of recognized scientific experts and expertise, and with that of rigorous mainstream peer-reviewed scientific claim. But it's not a lack of trust in science as a concept or as a process. So what does that mean for us as science communicators? Well, I think it's probably a moment also for us to reflect on what we do. What do we do when we communicate? And what do we communicate? When we talk about science, what do we actually mean? And I suspect many of us rarely, if ever, reflect on what we mean by science. I suspect many of us lump together science, all aspects at once, depending on what we mean. We leave it ambiguous. And in fact, sometimes we even draw on this ambiguity to achieve our communication aims. Sometimes without much foresight as to how that might affect the way science is thought of socially. Um, for example, you know, we, we don't often think about, we might think about why we're communicating science, but we might not think about what science in that context means. Are we really, are we trying to make facts more explicit? Are we drawing on the authority of science? Are we wanting to push for more science-like reasoning? Consider the phrase, we need to follow the science, which we hear quite regularly. What do we mean by that? I mean, do we mean we need to follow 
the facts of science. We need to follow the recommendations of science. These are different things, right? We need to follow the claims of people in scientific authority. What do we mean by that? And they're very, very different things. So I think we need to be much, much more thoughtful when we talk about science. I think this is a really important moment for us as science communicators. If we care about trust in science, we need to also be much more explicit about what we mean with science. Um, because I think we can't expect people to trust something we haven't explained or defined or that we've left vague. So I think there's a place of being clear about what we mean by science and what we're talking about when we talk about science. And I think that's more than my five minutes. So thank you. Thank you very much, Fabian. And um, he didn't answer his own questions. So maybe in the discussion, and I'm hoping that we'll have a really good time for discussion, maybe in the discussion, we'll get, it, we'll, we'll get him to answer and get some of the other panellists to look at, well, what is science, particularly in this so-called post-truth age? And what does that mean for trust? But now I'd like to move to our second uh, presenter. And I'd like to welcome Frederica Hendricks. She's, um, I'm delighted to have Frederica along because she's a, an early career researcher. And I think as PCST president, I'm really keen to encourage a diversity of speakers in these webinars. Um, Fabian's probably more the middle-aged older presenter, but Frederica represents that young, enthusiastic research element that we're trying to encourage in PCST. And she's going to be um, talking about communicating science and what makes people trust them. And she has quite a big history in looking at trust and, and science and scientists. So I'm very interested to hear her perspective. Thank you very much, Frederica. Thank you very much for the invitation, Jenny. And thank you, Fabian, for the um, super interesting conversation starter. Um, I kind of want to jump into uh, discussing all of this, but uh, I'll wait till the discussion with everyone. Um, my perspective on trust in science is a little bit different than Fabian's um, because I'm a psychologist, an educational psychologist. So what I'm actually interested in is um, people's decisions on whether to trust um, experts or scientists. So uh, my research has focused on um, what kind of cues, what kind of elements in conversation in um, yeah, experts representation people take into account when they decide whether to place a trust in an expert. Um, so um, yeah, this is kind of um, the, the focus. And um, I, in this little presentation, I want to um, kind of focus on another paradox, um, namely the one that, um, or the question why we actually should encourage people to trust science and scientists um, because uh, from our conceptualization of trust is um, the important perspective that we say trust is not blind. And let me um, point out to you why um, this is a, an important notion here. Um, so the backbone of science kind of is to challenge authorities, to challenge the current knowledge and to progress into um, more um, yeah, more knowledge, more uh, future-oriented technological applications and so forth. So um, the idea that we should not trust what is already known, what authorities say is something that has been driving um, the en uh, endeavor that science is. So um, trust in science, on the other hand, is something that stems from the idea that actually knowledge has to be shared uh, among researchers and among people. We cannot all know everything. And this is something that accounts to researchers themselves. Um, imagine those a thousand author papers from uh, CERN, uh, from uh, physics, for example. Not every one person that has authorship on these papers knows every single detail about um, the experiment that has been done. So people in science have to trust each other. That is a notion um, from Hartwig. Um, for example, already in 1991 as a philosophical notion. And the same thing is true for our um, engagement with, with science as lay people in, in most uh, fields of expertise. We have to trust the knowledge of experts, of scientists, to kind of get 
uh, head with um, the questions we have about our daily lives, about um, the functioning of society, about the problems we face, COVID, climate change as societies. Um, so there, this is kind of the, the um, idea we come from, the total necessity of trust in science. And then we ask um, what actually makes people trust in science. So um, in experiments and controlled experiments, um, we let um, communication go in different ways. For example, in one experiment, um, we had experts disclose um, errors in their communication um, and overconfidence in results, for example, or we had them disclose ethical aspects of communication. Uh, or of the topic itself, um, we had them um, say something about the uncertainties behind um, their science. And actually, um, what we find is um, that especially um, two components of trustworthiness of experts are affected by such communication, namely integrity and benevolence. And this is the second message I want to convey that um, scientists are not only trusted for their expertise, they are also trusted for behaving according to the rules and standards of their profession and according to their goodwill towards other people and society in general. So um, scientists are not only um, trusted for giving good knowledge for their epistemic claims, as uh, Fabian has stated, but also for um, communicating in an uh, open, transparent, and um, informing way um, for everyone else. So I think um, we are in a good place, as Fabian has also stated, um, all over the world, scientists are um, very highly trusted. So and that's almost as well as doctors, um, politicians, journalists, and other professional groups that are trusted far lower or less um, than um, scientists. But interestingly, we also see um, a lot of backlash right now against scientists. Um, in Germany, there has been this case in the last um, week where a, a main newspaper has um, uh, said, well, these are the lockdown makers and posted a picture of three scientists from Germany and said um, they're kind of, uh, um, yeah, they want to, to make political um, decisions. They want to press politicians into making these decisions, etc. So we have certain groups in society that challenge um, science and scientists themselves. And, and what I want to pose for discussion is the question of how can we advance our communication on the one hand to come across as integer and benevolent to people, but also um, how can we encourage scientists and kind of protect them from public backlash? Yeah, so those are my five minutes, I think. And thank you again for having me. Ah, thank you very much, uh, Frederica. And again, you posed a question and I'm really interested in that word benevolence. So I think we can discuss some of those things and we're getting starting to get some questions in the chat. So I really encourage you to, uh, to uh, get those, um, those things in and so that we can, questions in so that we can really stimulate our discussion. I would like to turn to our third speaker today and it's a colleague of mine from the Scientific Committee, Martha Entradis. Um, I'm going to ask her to start her video so that she can come on and, ah, yes, yeah, she started her video and I'm going to uh, put her on. Marta, I've known Marta for many years. She's from, uh, from uh, one of my favourite countries, um, Portugal, but she's working in the UK at the London School of Economics and Political Scientists. And she's going from science to scientist to now look at science institutions. And I know she's done a lot of work in this space. It's really interesting. So thank you very much, Marta. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll make some observations on how research uh, institutes and universities uh, are addressing publics and society. And this is based on um, research that, that I've been conducting in the, in the last years um, <clears throat> and two ongoing international projects on um, science communication um, at the institutional level. And I will also discuss consequences of what research institutions are doing for public trust uh, in science. 
uh, so I'll start with my first observation um, uh, from evidence uh, of these projects um, that clearly show that institution uh, points to institutionalization of what I would ca call the science communication function of, of universities. Um, and this is seen in, in different levels. Um, we see a, an increasing public communication activity at, uh, at research institutes and the uh, universities that host them um, over recent years and institutions also intend to increase this, um, this activity in the future. Um, although the predominance is for one-way communication and focus on traditional media, less than social media channels and dialogical co-creation approaches. Um, second, we also see uh, an increasing professionalization of the activity within, within institutions. Um, and we can see these in increasing resources um, that are allocated to the efforts, such as funding, um, specialization of staff, adoption of policies and guidelines for public engagement. Um, and interestingly, um, we see that institutes that have more communication resources also put a stronger focus on, on media communication that seems uh, that the bet is to establishing a media and public presence, um, which also suggests priority goals for uh, public vi visibility rather than uh, public engagement itself, um, which might bring consequences for uh, trust in science, particularly in, 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 in topics that are controversial and that need uh, different formats of communication, um, two-way engagement dialogue. Uh, and we could take the example of COVID-19. Um, and as colleagues have said already, institutions and scientists are the most trusted sources of scientific information and trust in them have increased during the pandemic. We have just seen the, the Welcome Trust survey released uh, um, uh, last week that shows this uh, increase uh, in trust uh, uh, very well all over the world. Um, we also see that, and this is from my own research on the COVID topic, that scientific messages and information, um, uh, attention to scientific messages uh, has increased uh, uh, over, the, uh, over the last years, and this has effect on public, on public trust as well. Uh, well, we know less about the, the, the content of these messages, um, and we could also ask what trust really means. Uh, and I think Frederica already touched a little bit on this topic. Uh, well, the question is whether these levels of trust are going to be maintained um, and how can institutions help keep this trust high at the same time that they take on board responsibilities of contributing to public enlightenment and civic, civic engagement. Um, so I think the key um, to keep this trust is actually to write, to ask the right questions, to ask good questions. Uh, and are good questions being asked when we decide about what to communicate, how to communicate, with which tone, and considering the, science, the specific uh, uh, context where people live in? And it's very important in the COVID um, uh, pandemic. Uh, particularly when we move to a different phase of the pandemic, uh, where um, half of the world population has been vaccinated so far and campaigns uh, are still going on to vaccinate, vaccinate more. Um, so what is, we could ask what has changed in the lives of people with this pandemic and how has it affected them? Um, can we, um, as communicators and uh, scientists, researchers, really move the conversation uh, and institutional and individual scientist communication to other levels, to levels where we can discuss openly the scientific developments, the robustness of the advancements, the bad science about the disease, the efficiency of the vaccines. Uh, can we contextualize numbers of deaths, of the seriousness of the disease compared to others? For example, in Portugal in the past month, that has been less than 3% of the deaths that were due to COVID. Um, can we create awareness and responsibility rather than panic? Um, can we move the conversation to a level where we listen to people's side uh, where they actually fit and want to do 
uh, debates that consider public opinions and relations to, to science and the context where they live have not been taken place. Uh, that is an excellent book that is uh, uh, by a colleague uh, of us, um, uh, Bank of uh, Bank of Allied, uh, that touches a little bit how the the, the COVID um, has been treated in, in in countries in Africa. Really looking at the context and how people re relate to the disease itself. Uh, can we live responsibly and free? in a pandemic with a virus with such characteristic like this one, are we allowed to have these conversations? These important debates have not been taken so far. Um, and so I'll just ask, how can institutions and scientists help move the conversation? What is our role here to move the conversation to such levels? Uh, and I think I would leave this uh, here, Jenny. Thank you very much, Marta. Uh, sorry about that. I just forgot to unmute myself. Uh, I'm very. Um, we started already to to get questions in the chat. There's already three really good questions there, but I'd like to see some more. So as we lead into our last speaker tonight, tonight for me it's very early this morning for Julia. I mentioned that it was. Um, must be almost half past one in the morning now for Fabian in New Zealand. Well, in Mexico, it's um, half past six in the morning. Is that right, Julia? Yes, that's correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome Julia Taguena to um, this webinar. I've known Julia for a very long time. She used to be a member of the scientific committee, and I still remember acting in a play with her that Massimiano Bucchi wrote, um, <laughs> that we performed in uh, Brazil. <laughs> um, not Brazil, yeah, it was Brazil. Yeah, it was, it was yeah, Brazil. It was Brazil, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah uh, uh, we did a great job. It was it fantastic. <laughs> I thought so too. <laughs> but back to this whole issue of trust, Billy is now moving from institutions to look at the citizens. What is it that makes an, an intelligent well-intentioned person distrusts the science. Thank you very much, Julia. Well, thanks to you, Jenny. Thanks to PS PSCT for, for this invitation. I'm very happy to be with you here. Uh, because it's so early, and because I wanted to be sure that I was using the right words, I have prepared a very small uh, text for you, which will take the five minutes I have. So uh, what to do as a science communicator when somebody denies what we know to be a scientific fact. This has become particularly relevant with the COVID outbreak and the anti-vaccine movement. There are examples where the nine scientific facts can have a political or an economical motivation. However, people that do not trust science, especially related to health issues, are not necessarily acting because of a lack of information or a conflict of interest. All types of people can make decisions about health while ignoring scientific facts, even in life or death situations. It is said that to be a tolerant person, you must be able to step in other people's shoes. So let us ask ourselves what can make an intelligent and well-informed person not trust a scientific fact. I will refer to a book written by two doctors, Sarah and Jack Gorman, about why we deny facts that could save us. The title is very inspiring. It's called Denying to the Grave. Studies on the psychology behind the denial of science take us to the Homo sapiens original reaction for survival. Our species has always wanted absolute answers. Critical thinking about hypotheses that can be proved wrong is not very reassuring. Why do some parents refuse to vaccinate their children? Why do they choose to have guns at home when statistics show that they often led to family tragedies? Why take antibiotics without prescription when they are not needed? All these reflect the psychology of science denial. People may be using intuitive answers that, we were, that were very useful while we were hunter-gatherers. 
Back then, the answer to danger had to be immediate without a chance to analyze different options. Another challenge is the resistance to integrate new concepts, culturally speaking. One might think that a good educational program should be enough, but beliefs change very slowly within society. And the teaching of science many times does not really include the de development of a scientific reasoning. Scientific reasoning does not produce absolute truth. All hypotheses could be changed, but human beings like to have assurances and scientific doubts can be interpreted as a lack of knowledge. Our search for absolute answers once again take us to the original need for an, an immediate response to danger. An anti-scientific attitude is not necessarily due to lack of information as we just have said. It could be related of how our mind works. A good conference in which we share solid data will not change that. But the way we tell the story could make a difference. For instance, it is important to speak in positive terms. This medication only works half the time, and it cures 50% of those that use it. Might mean the same thing, but there is no doubt that the wording uh, used did, does matter to the audience. The Gorman's book is divided in six chapters around crucial factors for science denial. The first one, is a charismatic leader that has convinced you of something. The second one, the fear to complexity. We search for simple answers. The third one, the fake news that you can read in internet. For instance, that vaccines produce autism. The, the, the fifth one, conspiracy theories. And finally, knowledge gaps, things that you just haven't studied or are not aware of. Statistics are an area that is often very difficult to grasp. In this subject, I recommend another book, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, who was the winner of the 2002 Nobel Prize of Economics. By fast, he means instinctive and emotional, and by slow, he means more logical thinking. Finally, if you are interested in politics, in the same sort of idea, I recommend the book, The Darwinian Left, Politics, Evolution, and Cooperation, where a very well-known uh, biologist expert in ethics, Peter Singers, argues that the political left must radically revise its outdated view of human nature. He shows how the insight of modern evolutionary theory, particularly on the evolution of cooperation, can help in attain its social and political goals. So in conclusion, what we can do as science communicators to counter science, uh, to counter science denialism, always treat the audience with respect, transmit more than facts, speak of the way science is constructed, explain how the ability to utilize scientific reasoning helps in protecting our lives and those we love. This is a big challenge, I know, but one of the evidence shows that we must tackle head on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julia. I'm going to add a spotlight to all of our panel now. Um, where are we? Here we go. Add spotlight. Uh, well, I think um, the lovely Anna is doing this for me. We're all spotlighted, excellent. Um, thank you everyone for your uh, very stimulating discussions. Um, being a host, I feel like I need to go back and watch them again via video so I can ask all the right questions. <laughs> but I have some questions of my own, but before I go to my questions, I'm gonna start with one of the questions that was actually asked towards the end of the list of questions I'm going to ask you. And that was, from Marina Yobert from South Africa, because I think it goes to the heart of what we're discussing. Mm -hmm. She said, do we really want total trust in science from the public? And I guess that also means, do we want trust in scientists? Um, and she goes on to say, 
is it not healthy, especially in a dem democratic society, to have a critical public and a critical journalistic community and a certain level of scepticism about science? After all, science can go wrong and science can sometimes, uh, and we can see cases of scientific fraud, flawed studies and so on. Perhaps we should focus on trust in the process of science rather than scientists. Just some thoughts. So, Fabian, would you like to respond to that? First of all, we've had some very strong agreement from uh, our audience on that. Absolutely. Look, um, sure, Marina, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that's absolutely... Uh, right. I think, in fact, this is one of the tensions in trust in science. You know, I mean, in a way, for me, this was part of what I found really interesting with this idea, because we do have this, this kind of real tension between trust in the claims of science, trust in the processes of science, trust in the institutions of science. And we lump these together and we sometimes add extra spice by mixing up expertise and science. They're not the same thing. You can be an expert without being a scientist. You can be a scientist and, not, and talk about things you're not an expert in. So there's all sorts of mess in there. And I think that's absolutely right. And it's not, by the way, just in a good democracy. If we care about science, then surely part of science is to question things. So if we really care about science, it can't be just blindly agreeing and believing what others have told us unquestioningly. And we shouldn't always trust science. I mean, I think Wakefield's article that was published in one of the best scientific journal is exactly why sometimes we shouldn't trust science, right? Um, so there's real questions. The, the challenge is about honing in the skepticism to target the right kind of places. So it's how the question is not, do we trust science because science is this nebulous mass, but it's how do we develop a critical skepticism that is targeted and useful rather than develop a, a blind, you know, following of facts or, or, or acceptance of claims and authority from whatever name. That's a really different thing. And the challenge is to find this right way of generating the appropriate form of criticality. I haven't got an answer. I'm a philosopher. I ask questions. I don't provide answers. But I, I think you're absolutely right. I've noticed that you would keep asking questions, Fabian. Um, <laughs> I noticed Martha responded in the chat, so I'm going to go to her next. What are, you, what are your thoughts on this issue about, you know, are we after absolute trust? Yeah, uh, thank, thank you, Janet. Th thank you, Marina, for this, um, for this comment. I couldn't, couldn't agree more. And I think that's a little bit what I tried to, uh, to say um, uh, about the meaning, the meaning of trust. Um, what is actually um, trust? What dimensions of trust are we talking about? Um, and do people trust in the scientists, in the institutions, in the process? Do we, if we, if we have scientists saying messages that um, might be controversial, do still people uh, believe in that reg regardless of what the message they're passing? I mean, is that the institution or is it the message? Um, I think that's what I wanna um, to say about this. Yeah, is that the institution or the message? Now, Julia has a hand up, so I'm going to go to her next, and then Federica, I'll, I'll ask your comments as well. Julia. Well, abs absolutely, uh, absolute trust is not scientific at all. I was trying to make that point. The point is to be critic, is to have this, this way of building the, your, your, your answers. And it's impossible to make a huge list, for instance, for your children, or the fake news. There are so many, there are so many lies floating around. What you have to teach them is how to analyze them. So the, the only answer is to have this sort of uh, critical thinking. I was never, never thinking on absolute trust. That is completely anti-scientific. But thank you very much for your comment. Thanks, Celia. So critical thinking rather than absolute trust. Frederica, do you have anything to add to this uh, interesting conversation? Yes, I think um, I want to point to two kind of implications this has because I would absolutely agree with Marina. I would absolutely agree with um, Fabian calling this the um, 
uh, yeah, the very central attention in trust that we kind of, or trust in science, we, we need to trust science because it, it takes us forward as a society. Um, it develops vaccinations that we need to take up if we want to tackle COVID, for example. But on the other hand, um, we need to be wary of the moments in which there's fraud, etc., as Marina has pointed out. And so um, one very um, central uh, educational goal is to promote the critical thinking of students to make them um, yeah, aware um, of how to trust science. And this is also what we study in, in trying to find out when people actually pl place trustworthiness or, or uh, judge the trustworthiness of scientists high and when they are critical and, and when they have vigilance against um, the claims of scientists because there is something in the conversation or in the person that makes them um, pay attention to um, their put the potential that they might not be trustworthy. So I think um, this kind of um, yeah, personal um, um, factor in people is something that needs to be supported in education. But on the other hand, um, we need to uh, also address this as a communication issue where we actually yeah, want to promote trust in the process of science or we need to figure out if we want trust in the process of science or we want trust in the institution or um, what we want to say about science that makes the whole endeavor, the whole um, scientific knowledge as, as a field, as a way to know about the world um, a trustworthy thing like the the consensus for example or um the the way science progresses over many years um, what do we want to point out in science communication that actually um as a mechanism as a system makes science a trustworthy endeavor i think this is also a central question for us here indeed and um, i want to come back to this a little bit later on before we finish um to look at trust and what that means in terms of creating positive change. So what role that plays. I'm going to go back to one of the first questions that we've had on the chat, and it's for Fabian from another colleague of mine, Michelle Redlinger, who asks, when thinking about different kinds of science in relation to trust, could we argue that a lack of trust in science is often more associated with scientific findings or expert opinion that informs controversial policy area areas? Or is this a commonplace assumption that just needs unpacking? Well, yeah, thanks, Michelle, it's, and, and hello. Uh, it's, a, it's really interesting, right, because I think there, there's, I'll go back, there was a lovely paper quite a few years ago, maybe 15, 20 years ago by um, Daniel Sarowitz about what makes a scientific topic, a scientific controversy and I think, in fact, it speaks to something that's, there is certainly something about trust in controversial topics. And one of the, the things that's interesting is that, of course, not all scientific topics become controversial. Some are kind of, you know, we're all happy with, and some become much, much more contentious. And there's something here about what makes something contentious and controversial. And often part of the challenge in what becomes controversial is when value statements are not particularly well articulated, when they're blended in with the scientific claims. And it makes me think about some of the, something you said, uh, Marta, about, about you asked about how do we think about how does things change, say, with the next stages of COVID, for example. And it's something that I've been thinking for myself recently is about how do we, at what point does a scientific topic stop being a scientific topic? I mean, is COVID still a scientific issue? Is it a social you. issue? At what point do you go from look, you, right, social political, right? At one stage, yes. I mean, oh, at first, it's it's very science. We need to get the vaccine. We need to understand how this works. But once you start to say, okay, so there's boundaries that are closed. There's restrictions on travel. There's there's payments being made to people. At what point does it stop actually being so primarily scientific? And when does it then become science? And at what point does science need to learn to stop playing the expert? And, and acknowledge its place and acknowledge when others are the right speakers. And I think to respond to Michelle, there's an element where trust is really difficult in contentious issues because it's not clear where the place of science is. And science often is particularly helpful in early stages when it is unknown and we not need lots of information. And then to give ground to other forms of expertise becomes really difficult. So I think this is a really interesting area to, pick, to unpack. I think we need to think about this. And as communicators, we also need to learn and think about whether or not we're drawing on the right experts when we're drawing on scientists in those kind of areas. 
Thanks, Fabian. Now, Marta, did you want to add to that? I noticed that you were had some thoughts. Yeah, well, uh, indeed, I think that's what I was trying to 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 put in my message without being accused of uh, uh, being a negationist, right? Because <laughs> that's another thing that we face now. You know, when we try to move the conversation a bit to another level. Um, the, the stamps uh, start emerging, right? Um, well, just to, just to follow up on this, I, c I couldn't agree more with uh, what uh, Fabian has just, has just said. And uh, perhaps we need to think about um, what is our role in this next stage of communication of the pandemic. And one, one thing that I would like to say, and then I, I, I think I mentioned as well, it's like, the, 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 the deaths are, slow, are so, uh, so low now. Um, and, and I gave a number that was just out um, recently here in Portugal in the, um, the 3% of the deaths being uh, uh, by COVID. Nevertheless, the communication and the scientists, uh, um, the medialization of, of the COVID is still, is still very strong in the Portuguese TV and uh, scientists coming in speaking about it. Um, for something that you know is 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 is, is probably uh, more a political issue now than it is a, 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 about science, and I think we haven't been able to move the conversation a step forward. And I think it's time for us, as you know, communicators, researchers, to actually take this uh, uh, on board and think a little bit about uh, what it means to communicate about COVID at this stage after two years of pandemic. Okay, for the next question, I might go to Federica and Julia to address it. And it's an interesting observation by APJ Moran about the recent Welcome Global Monitor report on trust in science, which showed two anomalies. In the US and Australia, trust in science is, high, is, is higher than trust in science, whereas in Southeast Asia, trust in science is higher than it is in scientists. So how can we account for this anomaly about trust, science versus scientists. Frederica, do you want to buy into that one? I can try. Um, I think um, a little bit, um, uh, maybe there's some knowledge that is probably um, needed for, from like a cultural comparison. Um, how is science communicated or how does communication about science take place in those different places? Because I would count a lot of um, variants on, on, on that, um, how or what science means in those cultural um, um, backgrounds or in those cultural um, um, conversations, I guess. Because um, from a European perspective, I would say um, trust in scientists um, here um, is higher than trust in science. It's also the case in, in Germany and the science barometer that takes place here every year. Um, and they usually ask a question like, do you trust um, scientists on making um, claims about, for example, COVID-19 or something? And people place very, very high trust in that. So this is very focused on the epistemic um, part of, uh, of science. Scientists make claims that are informative to the public. And people think that scientists possess the expertise um, to com communicate truthfully about what is known um, in this um, about this topic. And science um, is seen, as Fabian has pointed out, as something um, yeah, consisting of many institutions, of many um, different stakeholders, maybe has connections to industry here and there. So what is actually salient about what science is um, depends on the situation and the context, what science you're thinking of. Are you thinking of... Um, well, traveling to the moon, something very non-controversial or um, green um, uh, energies or um, GMO foods, for example, this is a very controversial topic here. So whatever you have salient, you trust science as a whole when you ask people, do you trust science more or less because you're thinking of different things. And so I could um, interpret the different um, the difference between trust in science and trust in scientists. But um, I would love to know more if anyone uh, else has um, an idea about the cultural differences between uh, Europe and, uh, for example, Southeast Asia, as has been pointed out, because I'm, I would not say I'm an expert on that, and I would be very interested if someone could um, explain those differences. Julia, do you have something to add to this? Yeah. Yes, yes. I think it's a very good example that uh, uh, it was. I was trying to make that point that there are many cultural differences in the way 
science and scientific facts are handled. Uh, exactly the point of what I try to, to present is that it depends a lot on how we are, on the, um, the culture we have, the beliefs we have. And I'm not surprised the results are different. I mean, it's, I, I couldn't answer exactly why, but it has to do probably with one of the chapters of the book I mentioned. Maybe there is a charismatic scientist in that country that has convinced everybody that scientists are very good, or maybe, I don't know. I mean, I don't know the answer, but I think that is a very good example of the point I was trying to make, that uh, uh, the way we communicate has a lot to do with the people we are talking to. And the way the people is taking this is it also depends on your culture and also not only on your culture, but on many basic things of the way we are. That doesn't mean that we cannot change. I'm not saying that we are just a species that will do whatever intuitive comes out. It's clearly we are not. Clearly we can be trained and we have been trained for many years, but it's, it's a mistake to ignore the way we normally react. Of course, when I was thinking about the nine facts, I was thinking of something really strong, like the anti vaccinate movement, which is a very difficult thing to, to handle with. For instance, in my country, um, smallpox is coming back when it was completely eradicated. So uh, I think we are, I was thinking in real problems of uh, um, playing with your health when you take this sort of decision, not just in general aspects of controversial subjects, but on things that really affect the health of people. So it's a very good example. Thank you, JD, for pointing it out. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure, Marta, why we lost your spotlight there. Um, I, we've lost it again. I'm gonna go and put it back on. <laughs> oh no, there you are. Um, we are running very close to time, which is extremely unfortunate because there's so many questions I want to ask, but I'm going to go to one from Heather Doran, which I'd like everyone to address. And I'm going to put my own little twist on Heather's, Heather's uh, question. And she asks, I wonder if panellists can comment on the relationship between trust and change. Trusting in science can mean trusting in a new finding when it goes against what has gone before. For me, I, I'm interested in this whole idea of forming trusted relationships, which can for, create really positive changes. Um, and often that's about a relationship between scientists and non-scientists. Um, so I put my own little twist on that, but if I could have each of you address that question, we'll see how we go with time in us answering any of the other questions. So. Who'd like to go first? Um, I think I'll choose Fabian. Oh, I was hoping you'd give me time to think and get somebody else to go <laughs> first. Uh <laughs> You don't need time to think, Fabian. No, that's true. It doesn't matter how much time I have. I don't think very well anyway. So uh, um, I, I think there's some, I mean, I think it's true. That's one thing actually we haven't talked about very much is this idea of relationship, of, of real kind of relational building. We've talked a bit about this and it's really important. But this is a really, in a way, when we start to think, you know, I'm taking that's what part of what your question was, Jenny. But then it almost changes between trust and science and trust in a scientist. And it's not the same thing, right? Because scientists hold, depending who they are, hold some expertise in some field. Um, they don't represent science necessarily. They may, but they may not. Uh, and while that might be a helpful in the case, it can also be problematic depending on who the scientist is. Um, I do think if we do want to nurture trust, and sometimes, you know, we've, as uh, Marina's question brought up, we may want to question whether trust is what we want. There are cases when I think I want people to trust science and scientists because I want them to do stuff, like I want them to get vaccinated. Sure. Uh, and in those cases, I think wonderful, get somebody trustworthy, create those relationships. But I, I think talking about relationships is really interesting for trust in science. It's also, for me, sometimes problematic because you, when you start to think about charismatic people, we believe, um, that goes in all sorts of directions and it's not always great. Um, and in fact, for me, science is about following the process to get to good knowledge 
almost independently of the people. At least that's part of the appeal. Great. Okay, I'm going to go to Julia next. What do you think about this whole idea of trust and change in relationships? I don't think that trust is the goal. I think that that will change us is to use scientific reasoning normally to include it in the way we take decisions. That will make really a change. I don't think that we should go for getting the trust of people in science as such. I think that what we should struggle to is to transmit this possibility of analyzing, of um, taking decisions based on facts. Which facts? That depends because facts, as somebody has mentioned, maybe there are some, some facts that are wrong, you have to check them. So what I think that will change society, what I think that has changed society is this ability to have a critical thinking and to include the scientific reasoning in the, our normal day life. I think that democracies wouldn't exist with this critical thinking. So I think that that's where the change comes from, not from trusting just like that. That, that will be my point. Okay, thanks, Julia. I'm not totally sure I, I totally agree with you. I think... No, I don't know, no, no. Well, <laughs> that's I that's know, fine. I know. It's not my... I know, I know, I know. I know. You, don't have, you don't have to trust me, Jenny. You, I don't, I'm not asking you to trust me. <laughs> but I do trust you, and so I want to believe you. But I am now going to go on to Frederica and see what she has to say in this space. <laughs> I don't think I agree fully either because I think um, a combination could be it's kind of the the solution or I'm going to propose this I'm not uh, I haven't thought this through but I think it's critical thinking about trust who we should trust why we should trust because we cannot and this is wholly my point we cannot go without trust because we cannot be experts in everything I can't make a rational decision about whether to be vaccinated I'm totally out of my expertise my league here um, I just don't know what to do, but I have to place trust in that science works, that um, the scientific process works, that vaccination studies work and the controls on that work, that the scientists actually know what they're doing. And I think I can decide who I'm going to trust because someone puts it very transparently um, uh, how the method goes, maybe I can judge that or I can judge uh, whether the control mechanisms in place uh, are trustworthy and so forth. So I can make rational, critical choices on whether to trust scientists, but I have to place my trust on something and I have to infer um, basically without knowing fully um, whether someone is trustworthy. So I think a combination of trust and critical thinking um, would be uh, totally what we um, kind of, uh, um, or in my research, um, what's the, the, the idea we have of trust, that it's a critical trust. Um, but then I also want to uh, kind of add on to the, um, to the relationship part because um, I think science communication has been great at establishing relationships between people and scientists and stories of scientists um, who, um, and I think this goes well with what Fabian has said, um, stories of scientists who made great uh, changes, who, who Einstein, for example, who made a great discovery and ha has um, established a great theory um, that holds up. And, um, and it's a narrative that um, this was a totally new thing, but actually, um, if you go to, to it from a historical perspective, I'm also not an expert on that, but I have read about it, um, that it's kind of normal science. Einstein is dependent also on others. Science is a social endeavor, and Einstein wasn't a genius, a solo genius, um, without any other people who had discussed with him uh, theories he could rely on and so forth. And I think... It, um, changing the narrative a bit from talking about single scientists as standards to scientists, maybe scientists who can be trusted, but scientists who deliberate, who make established consensus and so forth, talk about what science actually is and why it is trustworthy. I think this is the way kind of to go um, with relationships or change the relationships people have with science and scientists a bit. Thank you, Frederica. I think you actually summarised and brought together Julia and Fabian very well there. Um, yes, I... <laughs> yes, 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 I, I agree, I agree, I agree. I will take your point, Frederica. I think you're right. <laughs> Marta, you have the last word before I'm going to actually ask everyone to stay on and put on their videos and say hi and bye for the year. So, Marta, final words of wisdom from you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Well, I think a, a lot has, has been said and there's uh, not much to, to add. I'll just 
uh, bring it back to the, the point of the responsibility of uh, institutions in uh, building these relationships. Uh, uh, and what we know from the evidence is that there is still a lot of work to do into these uh, understanding uh, people's points of view, engaging them, um, looking at their attitudes, taking their religions into consideration. You know, there's a lot of things that come up uh, and, and touch science and the way people see science and trust science. And I think uh, it's very important that uh, institutions understand that and really try to address uh, these with other models of communication that we've been discussing for years in the, in the, in the community. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Marta. Please join with me, everyone, in thanking Fabian, Julia, Frederica, and Marta for a fascinating discussion. And now I would like you all to uh, put on your videos and you can take your, your sounds off because I would like to say um, it's been a, a tough year, a year for many of you and for many of us and um, we're near the end. But we've had a wonderful series of PCST webinars this year and, and a conference. And, and so I'd like to wish you all the very, very best for the rest of the year and into 2022. And we hope to have lots more interaction with you in the future. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, and thank you for being part of this and wishing you all the best. Good to see so many faces. We know. <laughs> and thank you, Anna, for producing this uh, along with all the other webinars. Much appreciated. Bye, everyone. Wish Bye, you all everyone. Thank you.